next speaker is Mel Marley from TZM UK. Uh, her talk is The Psychology of Changing Minds and Behaviour. Mel is uh, a psychology graduate with a special interest in what motivates people. Uh, she has previously talked about how rewards don't necessarily translate into more motivation or efficiency and how intrinsic motivation is much better for this. Following that, she's been studying how people form opinions and make decisions and how to use that in activism. She earns her living as a software engineer and in her free time she goes to Toastmaster meetings, helps organise food not bombs, free food stalls in York and grow giant parsnips in, her, in an allotment. <laughs> Um, in the future, Mel is hoping to start an inter, inter, uh, intentional community and help make such communities a viable alternative for our modern individualistic materialist society. Please welcome Mel Marley. Hello, sound check works. Good. Okay. Hello, everyone. It's great to be back at Z Day. And today I'm going to talk about something we're all burning to know. How can we change people's minds, get them on board the RBE or positive money or transhumanist train of thought? And luckily, there's, there's a wealth of information out there on this subject from all sorts of books and scientific studies. So it doesn't have to be the Changing minds doesn't have to be the secret weapon of the advertising industry anymore. We as, we as activists can use the, all the same methods as well. And here's my credentials, so you, you, can, trust that, you can trust that I know my stuff. <laughs> so if you're like me, you probably started your activist career with the naive belief that if we only tell people the facts, everything will get better because people are nice and rational thinkers and we want change, right? So what does work? If we look into these studies, there's three broad aspects of how people do make decisions. So there's, um, there's social pressures such as majority opinion, authority figures. There's the previously mentioned inertia. So people tend to stick to beliefs and identities. And there's emotions, our lizard brain, pleasure, fear, so on. So as we can see, human nature gets in the way a lot. But we can flip this around, and I'm going to show you how. So let's look at uh, this, these three aspects in more detail. So first of all, social pressures. We tend to do what other people do. And one very famous experiment in this was the, was the Ash experiment, where People were given a visual task and if other people were answering before them, then if the other people answered wrong, the participant was also likely to say the wrong answer, even though they knew the correct answer. They just sort of went along with the flow. So how does this translate to activism? So a few researchers uh, tried to find out how to get people to save more energy. So they asked people, what motivates you to save energy? And people would say things like, because it helps society, helps the environment, and saves money. But when they, when they actually looked into it, they found that the people who really saved the most energy were, were the ones who had the perception that other people are doing it. So they tested this out. They created four types of leaflets on saving energy. One of them then say, saying that, oh, it helps society, um, it helps the environment, save money. And the fourth one said that most other people are doing it. And they found that the fourth type of leaflet was most effective. Well, pe people themselves wouldn't admit it, but that's how it is. That's how it is. And it also helps if uh, you can see another person model this desirable behavior. So, for example, in an experiment at a, at a university, they had, a, they had signs in showers trying to get people to turn off the tap while they're applying shower gel. And they found that if, if they had one student modeling that behavior, then even if he didn't talk to any of the other students, the other students would still do the same, you know, just go along with what someone else does. So this saying about being the change you wish to see, it can actually help bring about changes in other people as well. So, yeah. Uh, however, you have to be careful not to let this backfire on you. Uh, some 
some campaigns have sadly focused on the fact that many people do the undesirable thing like littering or so on and this this is actually not so good idea because it will only increase that sort of behavior because people see it as a social norm you know where social animals will look up to our groups and we want to belong to a group so we tend to just do what the group does so if you can find if you can find something that that you want people to do and it's already a social norm or is at least something people agree with then it, it certainly helps to emphasize that another thing that affects the ordinary human is authority figures and some of you might remember this clip Most people don't realize, but the Earth has been slowing for many years. And were it not for these huge and expensive fans behind me, we would have ground to a complete day and night halt. And every word out of my mouth is true. Do you know why? Because you heard it from some guy in a tie. <laughs> so that was from uh, Culture in Decline, which is a satirical show. But there's often a lot of truth in satire. So you can find that... Authority figures can say all sorts of things and people will believe them, like about weapons of mass destruction or, or I don't know what. And as science shows, authority figures can have quite an effect on people. So in the famous Milgram experiments, a guy in a lab coat got participants to give 450 volt shocks to another participant. You know, they would ask the... Oh, Oh, hello. Oh, oh, oh you know, Doc, I'm, I'm giving 200 volts here. Are you, are you sure this is okay? There is no lasting tissue damage. Okay, thanks, Doc. <laughs> um, it can also be used for nicer things, obviously. In another experiment, there were two experimenters where one of them would dress up as either a manual worker or businessman or fireman and the other experiment was seen fumbling around with a parking meter and trying to find some change for it. So the first experimenter would go stop random passers-by, oh hello, could you, could, could you give a dime for that guy? I don't have any. And then depending on what, the, what they were dressed as, if, um, if they were a business, dressed as a businessman or a fireman, they were much more uh, effective at getting random passers-by to give a dime to the person in need. And, well, dressing up for things is something that we all do for job interviews, for example, but we could maybe also incorporate this into street, inter street activism. So, dress like a bit nicer and cleaner. So, well, I normally wear a t-shirt and trainers, but I made an effort for you guys today. <laughs> now, the second big factor in decision-making is, what decisions have I made in the past? So we tend to come to build a, a sort of a self-identity, whether it's an activist or a Christian or a car lover, or a Top Gear fan, and, if this identity becomes under attack, we get, we get defensive and we may engage in cognitive dissonance and try to justify our beliefs. And this is something we as activists have to be aware of as well, because if we have been doing our campaigns in a certain way for a long time, it might be difficult to change these ways. And if we, so as we study the sort of literature on this topic, we might find that, oh, is this technique not effective and it feels as if that guy yelling but it's wrong in our faces but if we remember why we're doing this are we doing this just to just to make ourselves feel good or are we doing this because we want to make the world a better place and be rational and effective at doing so so choose your cue unpleasant truths or comforting lies well, since no one's walked out of the door yet, I'll assume you all want the unpleasant truth. But it's not so bad, really. As we'll see, there's a number of workarounds against this inertia problems we can use to nudge people in the right direction. So, what we want to do is get people to gradually adopt a new identity. So, the, this technique is called foot in the door. So, uh, in this six stickers and signs experiment, uh, the the experimenters went to 
went and knocked on doors and they had a big sign with them uh, um, saying drive safely and they were, they were telling people oh we're from um, from an organization trying to advocate safe driving uh, could we please put these signs in your front yard and only 17 percent of people agreed because who really wants a big ugly sign in the front yard so what they did in a, in a different neighborhood was start with a smaller request first so instead they brought window stickers that said drive safely asked people oh could you put this sticker on your window and virtually all people agreed and then a few weeks later they came back with the big signs again and asked oh could we put this big sign in your front yard now and 76 percent of people said yes now so it's a quite a big increase so what happened here by putting those stickers on your window you started to see yourself differently you started thinking that oh i'm the sort of person who cares about the cause of safe driving and then you were more likely to agree to the second request and there was a meta-analysis of similar experiments and there was an on average a 13 percent increase in compliance uh, which was often higher as well obviously but uh, what what helped to increase compliance was if the second request was similar, made by a different person a bit later in time, and also if you encourage the sense in self-perception, like you say, oh, you must really care about self-driving, thank you, or thanks, you're a very generous person. So you sort of help people, well, sort of nudge people to see themselves as a different person. That helps. And with this technique we have to remember to actually do the second request because we might be like oh, okay well we got them to agree to a small request that's cool now but we often have this effect that people do something good and then they feel like oh well i've done my part i can now do like i can be a bit more li more lax in another area now so you have to sort of keep doing the requests and getting them like nudging them on along this path really an alternative way to do this is to is when you you start with a large initial request ask them to do something that they definitely wouldn't do so it's, so then they basically want to slam the door in your face get you to go away and but then uh, you immediately follow up with a, with a smaller request, which is what you actually were hoping to get them to do. So since they said no to you at first, they're then more likely to, to agree to a second request. So this is called the door in the face technique. And this is it's something also often used in uh, productivity, sort of life hacking, where you want, let's say you want to get yourself to, to go jogging every morning, but you just can't feel like it. So you kind of, you almost trick yourself. Like first you say, oh, I'm just gonna, you know, put clothes on, go outside. And once you're outside, you're like, oh, no, I'll just, I'll just walk to the end of the street. I don't have to go jogging. And then uh, before you know it, you're, you're jogging. <laughs> And another way to turn to turn inertia around and use it in our favor is when you when you choose the default yourself. So because people often like just take the path of least resistance, pick the default option. And so if you want, you want to make the default option, what you want them to do. So the most dramatic example of this is organ donations. So. This is a graph of percentage of people who have agreed to donate their organs after death. And, well, the, the, the difference between the blue and the yellow is that the countries in blue have an opt-out system where you have to spe specifically say that, oh, I don't want that to happen. Whereas in the, in the other countries, you have to tick a box to say that, oh, yeah, I, I agree to this. And as you can see, no matter how much you can campaign you can only maybe get like 27 percent of people to say yes but if you do the opt-out then you just get 90 percent across the board and in this case you i guess you don't really have much of a choice anyway because like if you were a blood bank you could you could just say you could invoke social norms and use pictures of smiling previous donors but in this case you can't really do that <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
in some cases, this effect of inertia and cognitive dissonance can, can become quite extreme to the level of justifying clearly unjust systems, like as we, as we saw at the last election when people voted Tory again. <laughs> so there's a really good paper on, um, on why this happens. It's about the social justification theory, why people defend these unjust systems. So there's, there's four factors in play, which, which is largely about the fact that people want to, people want to belong to society, a, a group, and also people look towards these systems for st stability and order. So even if the system isn't that great, if it becomes threatened, they're a bit like defensive about it. Also, if they feel dependent on the system, if they feel there's no way out, how many of you have heard, oh, but capitalism is the best we have, it's, it's the only thing we have, you know. And also if they feel that in their personal lives they have low personal control, so they look towards these systems to help them. So that's why people often justify either governments or religion or even abusive relationships. Also, sometimes this goes as far as believing that the world is a just place and people generally get what they deserve so this often results in victim blaming so there were experiments where people heard about either a person who got who got stabbed at night either in a sort of a normally safe neighborhood or a bit of a dodgy neighborhood so when they heard that it happened in a dodgy neighborhood, they were like, okay, well, yeah, that person was a bit silly to go there, you know. And, and they feel like it's okay, the world is still just. But if it happened in a, in, a, in a place that they thought was safe, they get a bit, like, worried, like, oh, what do you mean? Does this, that, you know, b bad things happen to good people? No, that, that can't be true. And then they start making up stories about, oh, maybe the victim was a bad person, maybe they picked a fight or something, you know. And in, in, in today's society, we see this sort of thing a lot, especially against like the refugees, unemployed people, homeless, you know, oh, they must be just lazy and, you know, and it, it's often the people who need our empathy the most. So it's, it's quite a sad thing. And often these sorts of justifications only break down when, when it's clearly impossible to justify the system anymore, but by that time it might be too late. So, so we don't want to get there, and we want to, we want to focus on the fact that a more just alternative is possible. So if we address these four points, we have to show people that, you know, this, this system we're in currently, it's not the only way, and it would be even better if we had an alternative system in place that that people could move away to. So, you remember that Bucky Fuller quote from before? There's no point fighting the existing system, just start a better one. And we're not done with inertia yet. We come across it yet again when we're trying to debunk misconceptions. There's a, there's a classic study about it with multiple variations about a fictional warehouse fire where participants then start getting like news messages coming in where at first it says that oh these canisters of oil and paint were found in a, in a cupboard and they're like thinking huh could that have been the reason and later it said that oh scratch that that didn't happen actually but after the after this they're asked oh so what was what do you think caused the fire and because they don't have an alternative story they still fall back on that misinformation even though it was corrected. They said that no, this, this wasn't true. So, what we want to do is give people alternative stories to to replace these misconceptions. And so, when they gave an alternative story, then then they found that people quickly jumped on the alternative story. And it especially helps if the alternative is simple to understand, because many myths in society are, are very simple narratives, like you know, what's why why is the economy doing blah doing badly. Blame the immigrants, you know, simple. <laughs> Whereas if you started talking about so the whole like money and everything and then people are like, oh, uh, and they block out a little bit. So, so we want to have a very simple alternative for them.
Another problem is the familiarity, familiarity backfire effect, which means that often by repeating the myth, you actually strengthen the myth. So something that you don't want to do is go like, here's a myth, here's the fact, here's a myth, here's a fact. What you want to do is begin with the fact and, and then um, perhaps say that some people mistakenly believe that, then you mention the myth and then you quickly add some more facts on top of that. Or if possible, just don't mention the myth at all because, well, the way our brains work is that if we hear something, if we come across something, then it's, it gets strengthened in our brain and just sticking the word not in front of it, sadly, does not reduce the strength of that information. And, well, also, to remember from before, we don't want to attack people's identity while doing this. We want to, well, we shouldn't be like calling people ignorant or, Ill or scientifically illiterate when trying to debunk myths, because most people want to think of themselves as, well, not stupid, so they will just get on the defensive again. So, and also, if there's worldviews that get in the way, then you also want to sort of get around that a bit. And for, for more on this, there's a, there's, a, there's a great short little booklet that's about six pages and it's freely available online. So if you want to know more about debunking, that's something you could read. And finally, the third part of the talk is how, is how try as we might, we're not as rational as we would like to believe. And that's something that the advertising industry just loves to take advantage of. So, for example, an experiment was set up at MIT where they, they were offering people free coffee and then asking them to rate the coffee. And besides the coffee, they of course had the usual, you know, sugar and milk and cream. And they also had a set of kind of odd condiments like cloves, nutmeg, which they, they didn't expect anyone to put in their coffee and no one did. But what they varied was the containers that these odd condiments were in. They were either in sort of nice glass and metal containers with printed labels or in plastic cups with just something scribbled on. And they found that just this small little fact about the, the ambience around the coffee made people have different opinions of it. So they rated it as nicer when the ambience was also a bit, bit more upscale. So, for, for example, you see lots of advertisements where, where people are like, I don't know, playing in the park with their dog and smiling and laughing and you're like, oh, so what is this, what's this advertisement about? Dog food? No, just life insurance or something completely unrelated. It doesn't even matter what it's about as long as it's nice and makes people feel good. And this is, this is something you can use in your advantage. Just make your materials look professional and pleasant rather than something just hastily thrown together. It also works the other way. If, if you're expecting something not to be nice, then we might experience it as not so nice. So in another beverage-related experiment, um, <laughs> they, they had uh, people tasting beer. And uh, when they put two drops of balsamic vinegar in it, then most people when they were doing a blind test, they, they thought that this, this beer was better. But when they knew about it, they, they preferred the normal beer. So, uh, so, for, so, so if you've got unpleasant news for someone like, um, well, if you want someone to do, to, to, to do a big favor for you, like, uh, I don't know, give up your car or something, then you don't want to tell, tell them that right away. You don't want to put that on, your, on the title of your leaflet. Um, because people will often then avoid reading that. And it's, it's, it's often the same with, with, with empathy, avoidance, but where, where you see an ad advertisement come on about you know, people, people suffering somewhere, then your, your instinct is just to sort of turn off a bit. So coming back to the leaflet example, if you want, you want to make your title a bit more vague, so 
if, if it says, oh, this leaflet will make you want to go vegetarian, then people are like, oh, I'm, I'm not reading it then. Uh, but you can use empathy in um, in your favor if you use um, if you use stories rather than statistics. So it, it works better that way because then you can identify with the with these with the victims in the story. And of course, there's the caveat that science is never certain about anything, and and people are also very individual. So. So we can't quite generalize this, and, and it also might not exactly work for institutions. But if you want to get masses on board, then something that's worked for everyone is still likely to be a pretty good bet. And especially if you've tried the rational approach and it didn't work, then maybe some of these techniques could, could be used to make your activism a bit more efficient. But what, I really, what I'm really trying to stay, say here is that Whatever methods you're using, you should try to do a bit of statistics yourself and e evaluate the methods, see how many new members you get, how many people become active, and, and then you can, you can judge whether this method you're using is e effective or not. Uh, so, how do we nudge people out of inertia, and how do we make them feel good about good causes? Uh, you probably want to learn a bit more about the subject and share that knowledge, you know, about other techniques you might use. And you'll want to be patient with people because now you know why they are the way they are. And you should consider the same when you're donating to charities because do you want to donate to the charity that everyone is donating to, the charity that makes you feel the most empathy, or maybe look up just how many lives they're saving with your money. And finally, if you want to be an, an effective public speaking activist, then I encourage you to look up your, lo your local Toastmasters club, which is it's, it's a public speaking club run by its members and it's very supportive, so highly recommend it. And that's it for today. Here's a mountain of references if you want more details.